Great, so I'm happy to, uh, you know, uh, to welcome uh, the new season of uh, Global non community Geometry Seminar, uh, the new edition of the seminar. So uh, I wanted to uh, make an announcement about this uh, forthcoming volume. Uh, uh, it's uh, the volume of uh, conference we had last year, Cyclic Cohomology at 40, Achievements and uh, Prospects. So the volume is ready uh, to go to print by AMS uh, in the series Proceedings of Symposia in Pure Mathematics. So it seems uh, hopefully we'll be out soon. So, okay. So I let Alan to introduce the speaker now. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Omar Moshen from the University of Paris-Saclay. And uh, he will talk about characterization of maximally hypoelliptic differential operators using symbols and index theory. Okay, Omar, it's your, your place. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. And thank you for your presence. So uh, I will talk about maximally hypoelliptic differential operators. So, yeah, no. So one of the, the of most obvious questions one can ask when encountering a differential equation is, are all solutions smooth? And so if the answer is yes, we say that the differential equation or operator is hypoelliptic, which means that for any distribution u, du is smooth implies that u is smooth. Here, this is local in, in the strong sense. So if du is smooth on some open set, u is also smooth on that open set. And of course, the simplest example, dx, you can solve the differential equation. You have the fundamental sum of calculus, but the X on R2 isn't. Now, the general strategy to prove hypoelliptricity is to use, to replace this. Uh, you can see the cursor, right? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, the, the general strategy to prove hypoelliptricity is to replace this smoothness condition with Sobolev spaces, which are Hilbert spaces. And so they are better behaved than Frisch spaces. So what you do is you, if you can succeed at finding some function phi, which at infinity goes to infinity, and you can prove, so the sample of version of this hypoelliptricity for any k and for any distribution u, du is in hk implies that u is in h5 of k, then by sample of lemma, the intersection of all sample of spaces are c infinity, and so you immediately get that d is hypoelliptic. Okay, that's the general way to prove hypoelliptricity. Now, a very simple observation, if D is of order L, then phi has to be less or equal to K plus L. I can never integrate, func I can never prove that the integral of any C1 function is C plus C3, for example. So, and if you have the maximal possible regularity, that's actually what we say, an elliptic operator. And we have the famous uh, regularity theorem for elliptic operators, which is due to Kohn, Nuremberg, and Ormandels and many others. And the version I, I will state is the one from Hormander's book. So if D is a differential operator of order L on a smooth manifold, any smooth manifold, then the following are equivalent. So the first one is the regularity, the maximal possible regularity you can ask for your differential operator uh, using the strategy from before. And the second condition, which is a much more well-known and e much easier to verify condition, which is that the classical principal symbol doesn't vanish at any point point at any non-zero cotangent vector, which is of course much, much easier to verify than the first condition, okay? And if the manifold is compact, you can say more, you can say that this is actually equivalent to, to that, uh, the differential operator between the appropriate uh, sample of spaces is Fred Hall. Okay, I'll also remark that in one and three, uh, it's written with for all K, but it's actually, it's, the theorem remains true with there exist K for all is equivalent to there exist, okay? And this is theorem, uh, you, you can find it in Hormander's book. Now the goal of this talk is to generalize this theorem to a much bigger class of differential operators. So let, let me explain what I mean by this. So the previous theorem tells us that elliptic are hypoelliptic, but the converse is false. If you consider this differential operator dx squared plus x squared dy squared, it, it's not elliptic because you have the term x squared, but it is hypoelliptic. That's part of Hormander's work on some of squares operator. And the way Hormander proved this was using the strategy I said in the beginning. He 
he had some function fine. It, it's a fine. It's not a complicated. I mean, so the point is really not the function, but proving this implication. But anyway, that's the way he proved it. But Feinstein in the seventies had a different uh, uh, idea, which is instead of using the classical subgroup of spaces, one should use a different family of subgroup of spaces. So Feinstein defines these spaces. And I will just remark that here uh, I deal with manifolds which are not compact. I don't really care too much about L2 or L2 local. It's not really the point of this talk. So I will say L2, but choose whatever you like. And so they define these several of spaces. So H0, it's always L2 functions. And you define the others on natural numbers uh, using this Ricard relation. And you can still define uh, HS for S real and by interpolation and then negatives by duality. But that's irrelevant for the discussion here. These are enough. And the point here is that this X, this, so the, in the recurrence relation, you have this x. If you remove the x, this has a classical subgroup of spaces. But it is this, precisely this x which changes the behavior of these spaces. And so what are the things we observe? So the first thing is that we have this identity, which plays a fundamental role in Hormander's work, which is the Lieberecht of dx and x dy is dy. But this identity immediately implies its one-line proof that the second subgroup of space in the sense of von Einstein is included in h1. Mm -hmm. And by recurrence, you get that H2K is included in HK. And so this tells you that these subgroup spaces are intertwining. And so the intersection of all Fulham and Stein subgroup spaces is actually equal to the intersection of all of the classical subgroup spaces. And we already knew that this is the infinity function by subgroup lemma. Now we come to what Fulham Stein proves. So they prove that for any distribution you want, for any natural number k, du is in hk, implies that u is in hk plus two. And d here is the differential operator from before. So this is exactly re ellipticity if this the subgroup of spaces were the classical one, but this differential operator is not elliptic, so it doesn't satisfy them with the classical one, but it does satisfy them with this sub subgroup of spaces, okay? They, they also prove much more than this, but I will come to this point later, okay? And so we now come to the main point of this talk or the main definition. I will say it informally and then write it more formal. So what is a maximally hypoelliptic differential operator? It's a differential operator such that you can find the family of subgroup of spaces such that the differential operator satisfies the best possible regularity you can ask for for that family of subgroup of spaces. If you use a classical family, you get elliptic operators, but if you use a different family, you get more general operators like this one. So how do you define these families of subgroup of spaces? You just replace dx and x dy with vector fields. It's not complicated. So you take a manifold, any manifold, and you take any vector fields, and then you define exactly the same way von Einstein did uh, define their subgroup of spaces mm -hmm. by recurrence, and you take the vector fields uh, this way. Now a crucial part of all of the all of what I said is that you need the intersection of all subgroup of spaces to be C infinity functions. This, in this form, of course, the intersection is not C infinity functions. And to ensure that the intersection is, ever, is C infinity functions, we need Hormander's condition. And so, uh, uh, which I recall, it says that for any point in your manifold, if you take your vector fields and evaluate them at that point, and the leap brackets and evaluate them at that point, and then all of iterated leap brackets evaluated at that point, then this linearly spans the tangent space. Of course, the tangent space is finite dimensional. so you only use a finite number of free brackets, but you are allowed to go as far as you want. If you have for Hormander's condition, then the intersection of all of these sub of spaces is equal to C infinity function. And so you can use these sub of spaces to study hypoelliptricity. And now we come to the, our main theorem. So I will state it, and then the rest of the talk is to really explain the terms in the theorem. But at least when I state it, it's clear what we are trying to achieve. So this is our main theorem, which joint work in, uh, with Andrew Latakis and Junkin. So you take any vector fields on a smooth menu, any smooth manifold, which satisfy Hormander's condition, and you take a differential operator of order L. Of order L, you have to be slightly careful. I will explain it uh, in, in a moment, uh, 
be more precise, but if you take any differential operator, then the following are equivalent. The first is that the differential operator satisfies the best possible regularity you can ask for with respect to this family of sublock spaces defined using these vector fields. The second is a principal symbol condition. So first, we cannot use a classical principal symbol. We already saw that this uh, uh, doesn't work with dx squared plus x, x squared dy squared. So we have to use a different symbol. And so I will, so, so we have a condition using a principal symbol, which I will define in a moment, which involves a group, an important group GX, a family of representation, a reducible unitary representation, and injectivity of this of some operator. But the point is that this is equivalent. And uh, if, uh, for example, so, so this theorem generalizes the classical regularity theorem from before, if the vector fields expand the tangent bundle without needing to take commutators, then the group is the tangent space, the principal symbol is a classical principal symbol, and so you get the classical irregularities here. So this is a generalization where you allow V brackets uh, into the classical regularity theorem uh, for elliptic operators. And like uh, the classical theorem, you have also, if M is compact, uh, you get only left invertibility, if and only if. This is equivalent to left invertibility. You don't equate equivalence with thread holiness, only left invertibility. This is because the group is not commutative. So left invertibility is not the same thing as right invertibility. So that's one of the points where this theory diverges from elliptic operators. Okay. Uh, this was a conjecture by Helfa and Noriga from 79. They in 85, they published a book on maximally hypoelliptic uh, differential operators, which so operators which satisfy this theorem, we call them maximally hypoelliptic, which is, of course, plus much bigger than elliptic operators. And so they prove one implies two in full generality. And two implies one if the groups are of rank two. Uh, this means that in Hormander's condition, you take your vector fields and you allow Lee brackets, but only one step Lee brackets. You don't take any higher Lee brackets. Mm -hmm. So they, they prove the theorem under this assumption, but they didn't, but, and they conjecture that it also remains true more generally if you allow any iterated Lee brackets. For some differential operators of specific type, like Hormand or some of squares or even powers, things like this, you can, this was proved by Rothschild and Stein from the 70s. Okay, but that's only works for some specific differential operators, not any differential operator. And as I said, uh, a differential operator which satisfies these conditions is what we call a maximally hyperelliptic differential operator. And of course, that implies hyperelliptic. Okay, so the goal of the rest of the talk is to explain this second condition. So I will start with the group. The group is defined using its Lie algebra. It's the group integrating the Lie algebra. So I will define the Lie algebra. So the first thing we observe is that I don't really care about uh, the vector fields themselves. What I care about is the module generated by them. So if you go back to the definition of the sublog spaces, you will notice that here I could replace the definition with any vector field which is in the module generated by these xi's. The definition would be exactly the same. So what I care about is the module, not the vector fields themselves. So I'll define the module, which, so the first one is generated by the vector fields themselves. The second one, I add the Lie brackets. And then the third one, I add the iterated Lie brackets and so on. And Hormander's condition tells me that at some point I will stop and get everything. Now, these modules are all uh, finitely generated modules over C infinity of M. And so it's natural in some sense to try to localize them with respect to uh, 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 maximal ideals of C infinity of M. Now, we, we localize them. So the Lie algebra of the Lie group is this quotient. So it, it contains a localization, but we also kill anything of lower order. In some sense, this is contains, so, I still didn't define, of course, the Lie brackets, but this space, it, it contains the only relations you care about from the Hormander's vector fields. It's, it's, it's precisely the only thing you care about from the Lie bracket point of view. 
in the next slide, I will define the Lie bracket. But let me just give you an example what it looks like as a vector space. So if you take the manifold R2, F, and you take the example as before from Folland and Stein, dx and x, dy, then F2 would be everything. So you stop there. And the Lie algebra, it's R2 if x is non-zero, but if x is zero, it's R3. Okay, if it's generated by dx and x, dy and dy. Okay, and so the, we observe that one, it shifts in dimension, the dimension is not locally constant. Second, this is actually a good thing because, so if you look at the differential operator from before, it's hypolipticity, any study on the hypolipticity of this comes from the Heisenberg group, which is dimension three. And here the manifold is of dimension two. If the Lie algebras don't jump in dimension, I will always get a commutative Lie algebra. So I really need the Lie algebras to jump in dimension to have a chance to get something which is more interesting, which helps here. Now, the Lie bracket, where it comes from, so by the definition of the modules, Fi and Fg is inside Fi plus G. And so this descends when I localize, that's straightforward. And so this gives me the Lie algebra structure. By definition, it's a graded nilpotent. By graded nilpotent, it's if the Lie bracket, uh, if you take the Lie bracket of two things which are of degree, the sum of their degrees goes higher than n, the Lie bracket is by definition zero. So by construction, it's 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 nilpotent with nilpotency rank at most n. Okay. And the group GX is a simply connected Lie group which integrates this Lie algebra. But here it's a big, uh, this is an important Lie algebra. So the group, you can just take the Lie algebra itself and the product is the baker campbell hausdorff formula. So it, it's not an abstract group. And if you want the, the, Lie, the example from the previous slide, the Lie algebra here is commutative, of course, but here it's the Heisenberg group because the Lie bracket of DX and X dy is dy. Okay, so this is R3, it's actually the Heisenberg group. Okay. Now, here we have to change, I said that the order has to be changed. This is the whole reason we introduce sub of spaces is to have uh, differential operators. We want differential operators to be bounded operators. So that's the only reason we introduce sub of spaces. And so be between appropriate degrees, and so we have to change the order of a differential operator if we want to have a chance to, 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 make, to make the theory work correctly, you have to change the order of differential operators. So a simple observation, any differential operator can be written as a polynomial, non-commutative polynomial uh, uh, in the vector fields. That's very simple. You have Hormandas condition and commutators already are written as polynomials. So any vector field can be written and uh, any differential operator, of course, can be written. Here, polynomial, it's a, it has coefficients C infinity functions. non commutative polynomial is coefficients C infinity function. So any differential operator, you can write it this way. And you define the Hormander order of a differential operator as the minimum degree of the polynomial. This can be, it's always bigger than or equal, but it can be strictly bigger. So for example, if you like always the example from before, dx and x dy, of course, these two are of form under order one by construction, but dy is a form under order two. The only way I can do it is to write it as a commutative. I can do better than this. Okay. And as I said, the whole reason to change the order is that we want differential operators to be bounded when they act between the correct sub of spaces. And so we have this proposition, very simple proposition. If these are form under order L, then it acts as a bounded operator between the appropriate sublet of spaces of that degree. So now we defined the group and the order. We now define the uh, this principal sim. So take an irreducible unitary representation of your group. For the rest of this talk, when I say a representation, I always mean an irreducible unitary representation. So for the rest of the talk, I will, I'll just say representation. But keep in mind it's irreducible unitary. So take a representation of your group and you take the derivative. I don't really care about the group. I only care about the Lie algebra. So you take the derivative and that becomes a linear map acting on smooth vectors. Of course, unbounded uh, uh, operators. And if you take your differential operator, you write it as a polynomial in the Hormandas vector field. 
the symbol is you take your polynomial, you cut, you take its highest order term, just like you do with the classical principal symbol, and you replace each one of the vector fields with its image in the representation. Okay. For example, if you have if if the vector fields already spans the tangent space, then the group is the tangent space, the representation is just this where it's like a covector. The derivative is this, and this is literally just the principal, the classical principal symbol. But of course, you run into an issue here, which is, is this well-defined? That's actually much more complicated than it looks like. At least if you think a, a little bit about it, you'll see that this is not trivial at all. Because if you write a differential operator in two different, so by well-defined, I mean, does it depend on the way you write your differential operator as a polynomial in the vector fields? If you write your differential operator as two different polynomials, there is really no way to prove directly, or at least to see why should this give you the same result. And I can assure you, I thought about this a lot and I couldn't find it fruitful. So the first thing is that this is actually not all different. Okay, it's quite easy to create counterexamples, but they are kind of redundant, so I, I won't give them. But what is interesting is that it is well defined for some representations. And we will call these representations the hellfire noringa tangent cone because they were introduced in this article by seven, in 79 by hellfire noringa. Now, this tangent cone, there is two ways to define it. There is a way that hellfire noringa used originally, and there is a much more conceptual way using C star algebras. I will give you in the next slide, so here, the way, the original way hellfire noringa introduced it, which is a much, which allows you to compute the set but doesn't allow you to prove theorems. And in the end of the talk, I will give the actually much better definition of, the, of this set. So how do you define it? So the orbit method tells you that a reducible unitary representation of a group correspond to orbits. And so you only define the orbits and then you get the representations. So the orbits are, it's a topological definition. I will give it, but it's not very illuminating, but it is what it is. It, it, it lets you compute the set. So the condition is that you can find some numbers, Tn and R plus points, which, and the xi n, the points have to converge to your point X and the Tn has to converge to zero. And when you write your Lie algebra this way and an element in its dual as this, then you require that the L1 evaluated at X1 has to be the limit of this, L2 at, you add powers on how many D brackets you took. That's essentially it. In some sense, it's, if you want more conceptually, it's as follows. You take the tangent space of your manifold. Okay, you look at all of the different ways you can embed your tangent space inside using your Hormandas vector feed using Hormandas condition. And then you, in the Grassmannian, you look at all of the different ways you can converge from that the, to your point, and then you take the union of all of this. Uh, Omar, let me ask uh, one question here. Uh, is it related to the tangent group grouped in some way? Yes, that's a proof of the theorem, and I will give it in the end. Okay. I, I will explain exactly how it, uh, what's the connection with the tangent group uh, So Helfer and Norrig in 79 proves that this set, which as it's defined here, it's not very clear that it's closed under the conjoint action, but it is actually closed. And so it corresponds to some set of representations. And we prove that the principal symbol is independent of the choice uh, of the way you write your differential operator as a polynomial of the vector fields. So. So now I can write our main theorem again, but with the correct, uh, uh, but now written correctly. So if you take a vector field, any vector fields with any smooth manifold, which satisfy Hormander's condition, and you take differential operator, now it's Hormander's order L. So the theorem to, correct, to be correctly stated, you need to use Hormander's order. Then the following are equivalent. So the first is you require the best possible regularity with respect to sobel of spaces defined using the vector fields. And now for any representation in this tangent cone, this operator is injected. Now I will remark something. So uh, this operator is the way we defined it was a polynomial using the derivative of the vector fields. Uh, so this as, is a linear map acting on smooth vectors, of course, unbounded usually. And usually when people 
use deal with unbounded operators, they take the closure of the graph and study this. Here in the theorem, you don't need to take the closure of the graph. Injectivity, you only need to check it for smooth vectors. Okay, there is no need to take the closure of the graph. And of course, if M is compact, then one and two are equivalent to left invertibility. Now, our theorem is proved in a slightly more general context. And I'll explain why we prove it in a more general context. Uh, so consider this differential operator, dx squared plus x dy. So it's also hyperelliptic, and this is also follows from Hohenmann's work, but we cannot really apply this previous theorem because if you look at the, uh, uh, the principal symbol from before, it treats all vector fields equal. And so the principal symbol either, it will kill the x dy and just give me something not hyperelliptic. And so the solution is simple, you add weights to your vector fields. And so our theorem, we prove it in this more general context, which is, you take your vector fields and you assign any weights any way you like to each of these vector fields, then all of what I said from before can be redone, but using weights. For example, the Hormandel's order, you write your differential operator as a polynomial and you count the degree of the polynomial, but with weights on the variables. The principal symbol, when you look at the highest order part of the polynomial, you look at the highest order part with the weights into which, and for example, if you look at the definition of the characteristic set here, instead of having Tn, you will have Tn bar, the weight of the vector field. Here you will have Tn bar, the sum of the weights of Xi and Xj. Okay. So you just add weights to everything. So uh, I go back here. So you add weights to everything and the theorem remains two. You take Hormann as vector field, this one is equivalent to maximal hyperelliptic uh, is uh, with respect to the uh, to the sub of spaces is equivalent to the our principal symbol is injective and if m is compact this is equivalent to left invertibility and now this theorem can be applied to deduce that this differential operator is maximally hyperelliptic and so this theorem implies for example hormander's uh, sum of square theorem in its full uh, statement x1 squared plus xk squared plus x0, okay? Uh, but to be clear, it implies Hormander sum of squares, but the methods used are already much more complicated than what Hormander did. I mean, if you only want Hormander sum of squares, that's not the approach to it. It, it, it implies Hormander sum of squares, but it's, in some sense, it uses tools already powerful enough to imply Hormander sum of squares easily. Okay. Now I will pass to index theory, and uh, uh, and then I will give uh, an, uh, an idea on the proof of our, our theorem. But first, I will do index theory, uh, uh, which is a topic which is much more fun. So. Uh, if you so if you take a differential operator between c infinity functions to c infinity functions of course we define this analytic index this way uh, if both of these quantities are finite and that a singer has the index formula for elliptic operators and you can ask the same question for maximally hyperelliptic operators given that we now have a principal symbol which we can use to study maximal hyperelliptic so the first thing is a corollary of our theorem is the following equivalence. If the manifold is compact, which will always be assumed now, then the following are equivalent. You just apply the theorem to the differential operator and it's formal adjoint. And so D and D star are maximally hyperelliptic. And here the choice of the formal adjoint doesn't matter. All of them have the same principal symbol, so it doesn't matter. It's equivalent to saying that the differential operator between the appropriate several spaces is fed on. And so, and we can also observe that these two conditions implies that the dimension of both of these things are finite. And the analytic index is now well-defined and it's actually equal to the Fredholm index of this. So now we have the analytic index is equal to the Fredholm index of some bounded operator. So we can now use tools from K-theory, topological K-theory to prove, to study the analytic index. And so this is our second main theorem, which is a formula for the analytic index which is, uh, so the theorem is as follows. So again, you suppose you take any vector fields which satisfy Hormander's condition. You can add weights if you want, that makes no difference. On any compact manifold, and you take a differential operator, which is both the differential operator and its adjoint are maximally hyperelliptic. 
to ensure that the analytic index is finite. Then the analytic index can be computed using the, so this is a principal symbol and you have the composition of three maps. And I will explain now what are these three maps. Uh, so, but first, so if the manifold is a contact manifold and the vector fields span uh, the contact structure, then this theorem was already obtained by Van Aer uh, and Paul Bohm. Uh, uh, in this case, the groups are of rank two. Uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, 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 but to my knowledge, this wasn't known other, other than this case. So, uh, so what are the terms in this theorem? So if D and D star is formal adjoint are maximally hyperelliptic, then the principal symbol is an element in the case here of this C star algebra. So I will explain. So what is this C star algebra? When you, when you take a group, there are two C star algebras you can define, the maximal and the full, uh, the, the maximal and the reduced. The maximal, you look at all representations, the reduced, you only look at the left regular representation. But of course, you can make the same construction if you look at any set of representations. Here, you, what I care about, the, the groups are important. So, so these two systems are equal anyway. But what I care about are the representations in this helfer norigas set. So I take the completion of the C-star algebra, but only looking at these representations. And so the principal symbol now gives me an element in the case here of that C-star algebra. And now I, I need a, a, a localized version of quantum isomorphism. So remember that quantum, one implication of quantum isomorphism is that the case theory of the sister algebra of an important group agrees with the case theory of the dual of the Lie algebra. What I need here is the more localized version, which is instead of looking at the whole sister algebra, you only look at some representations. And on the opposite side, you only look at the dual, so, so the space which corresponds to these representations using the orbit method. So we prove some sort of localized quantum isomorphism, which implies in this case that the case theory of that C star algebra is the same as the case theory of this Helfer and Noriga set as a topological space. Yeah. And here I should mention that G star, so I defined each one of GX. And that's, of course, a finite dimensional vector space. I can take the union of all of them. I can equip this with a topology. It cannot be a smooth manifold because they jump in dimensions, but it has a natural locally compact Hausdorff topology. And so this is a subset of that space. And this is the topological case here with compact support. And this replaces the tangent bundle, if you want, an Atiyah Singer uh, theorem. And then you have an excision map from this space to, at, to the tangent space. Uh, this map is not an isomorphism in contrast, in general, in contrast to this one. Okay. Uh, this map, it, the way, so, so if, you, if you recall from the way this T star map was defined, this T star set was defined, I defined it using a limit of Tn goes to zero and some xi n. So the way it's defined, it's a cylinder over Tm. And so you obviously have an excision from it to T star M. And the last map, this is the easiest one. This is just a T Singer index map, uh, analytical topology. You can choose someone. And so you have equality here. Now uh, I will give you an example, a very trivial example. So the example, so the example is a very trivial consequence of this theorem. Uh, uh, of an index computation done using this theorem. So computation doesn't require much effort. You just apply, you just write down what the theorem says. Okay. Uh, so the simplest two families of vector fields which satisfy Hormandas vector, uh, Hormandas condition are dx and x power k dy. And this leave on R2. And since I do index, I want to do index theory, I want to compactify things. So the easiest surface to work with is the torus because I can make them descent. I can make the example work on any surface, but that's more complicated. So let's stick with the torus. And so dx descends, uh, dy also descends, x doesn't, so I replace it with sine x. But in reality, I can just replace sine x with cosine x, any analytic function, even any function which is not, which doesn't have like e bar minus one of x over x squared. So, not Taylor series, which vanishes everywhere. These are problematic. 
if I use any other functions, it's fine. So I have these two vector fields which satisfy Hormanzas condition. And I consider this differential operator. So K here is an, uh, so K here, so I have K plus one over two. If K is odd, this is a differential operator. If K is even, this is a pseudo differential operator. The previous theorem also applies to pseudo differential operators, but if you want, you can just suppose that K is odd. Uh, so the point here in this differential operator is what? So it's a differential operator of order K plus one. But if you look at its classical principal symbol, then it will completely remove this term and it will let you only see this term. And so from the point of view of the classical principal symbol, this is a positive operator. So it cannot have an index. But from the point of view of our symbol, this term will also be of order k plus one because the only way you can write dy using these two vector fields as an iterated k plus one times d bracket. And so our symbol sees the two parts and as we will see the index of this differential operator relies on this part as well as this part. Okay, so here you see the difference between this theorem and that single index theorem. The index depends on something of order one in the classical sense. But so anyway, so G here is any smooth function on the topics. Uh, the differential operator is of both uh, order you, three. Yes. You mean it will vanish if G is zero, for instance, or the index, or? uh yes yes of course but if you use zero this is a positive operator so uh, uh anyway i will give the end a formula for the index and it, it will also show this so, so the harmander's order is uh, uh, so the operator is a harmander's order k plus one but as i said this term is now harmander's order k plus one the only way to write dy is as a leap bracket iterated the bracket uh, k plus one time so now let us look what our principal symbol look like so i will look at a point on the torus. there are two situations either sign doesn't vanish or sign vanish if sign doesn't vanish the situation is much simpler because the vector fields span the tangent space at this point i don't need the brackets so the group is just the tangent space our principal symbol is the classical principal symbol the operator was already elliptic at these points everything is good okay even better, uh, you don't really see any K theory contribution from this part. Okay, that's uh, so. Uh, now, if sign vanishes, then you get much more interesting situations. So the Lie algebra, uh, as before, I only care about the Lie algebra. So it's generated by these terms. So it's of dimension K plus two. And it has these leap bracket relations. So it, it, it captures exactly what I want from the vector fields I started with. It, it's exactly what I, I had in mind when I started and what I get after this. Now, here is where things get slightly uh, 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 amusing. So this group is of dimension K plus two. It has many irreducible unitary representations. But surprisingly, this set, so from before you have this set of representations. Surprisingly, this set of representations is very little compared to the representations of the group. Okay. And so it's actually, so this group, so, it, so this set of representations contains the characters. I will not talk about them because they behave just like the classical principal symbol. So, can ignore them. What's more interesting is the infinite dimensional ones. And so it turns out that there are only two infinite dimensional ones in the set, and they're multiples, positive, non zero multiples. So it's the obvious representation of the group on L2 of R. Okay. And so you only need to look at the characters and these representations. The characters, this operator will be invertible always with respect to the characters. And so you only need that to look at this differential operator evaluated at these representations, and you get that this. It's an operator acting on L2 of R, and uh, this is a Schrodinger type, uh, no, this is a Schrodinger type operator. Uh, uh, so it, it, we know that it's, it has compact resolvent, it is diagonalizable on L2 of R, and so 
for this to be injective, all I need to do is that this should avoid the spectrum, plus or minus the spectrum, because I have plus or minus representation. So I need G at any point where sign vanishes. So it's zero Y or pi Y should avoid the spectrum of this. Whatever it is, it should avoid it. If K is one, we can actually compute the spectrum. It's, uh, this is a, a, a harmonic oscillator. So the spectrum is easy, but other than this, I don't know if we know how to compute this. Anyway, so this tells you when the differential operator is maximally hypoelliptic. I added here the adjoint because the computation is symmetric. And for this differential operator, the computation is symmetric. Now, let us look what the index, what the formula I wrote for the index tells us here. So if you consider this, this function, I will do the same thing for the other one. But if you consider this function, so this is a function from the sec, from S1 as y moves in S1 to the sec, and it avoids some points in the spectrum. So I can count how many times it loops around these points. And so the index is, you count how many times you loop around one point, uh, around each point in the spectrum with a sign for the negative ones because of the orientation. And you do the exact same thing for the other uh, critical uh, value of sine x. Uh, then the other point where sine x vanishes. How do you know that this sum is finite? Uh, G is bounded so it's g is continuous uh -huh. okay. uh -huh. and, and the spectrum goes to infinity I and see, the so it wind around only finitely many elements in the spectrum yeah. yes and g is um and, and this spectrum doesn't contain zero and so if g is zero uh, you get uh, zero from this sum which is what you would expect because then you get a positive operator so yeah, answering one of your questions from before uh now i will so I gave this talk a few times, and I always never had the opportunity to talk about the proof of this uh, of our regular uh, of our regularization theorem. But since this is non-commutative geometry seminar, and the proof uses uh, tools from non-commutative geometry, I will give a word on the proof, uh, but very very vague. But at least give you an idea what's what we do. So. Theorems of the type I mentioned, so proving that the differential operator is maximally hypoelliptic. Of course, you have Hormander's Holm method, but building on the work of Holland and Stein, there is this general procedure which was made by Holland and Stein, which by Rothschild and Stein, which is you take your differential operator on your manifold, you left it to some free nilpotent group, and on the free nilpotent group, the situation is much simpler. Your manifold essentially replaced it with a free nilpotent group. And then you prove regularity on the free nilpotent group, and then you push forward this regularity to the manifold. This is the method that Rothschild and Stein made, and they used it to prove Hormander's sum of squared theorem. So our observation is the following. So on the manifold M cross R plus, you have this singular foliation. So if you remember, we had these modules. F1 was the module generated by the vector fields. F2 was the module generated by the vector fields and the early brackets, etc. Okay. And Fn was everything because of Hormander's condition. And so a singular foliation on a manifold, that's a module of vector fields which is closed under Lee brackets, finitely generated, closed under Lee brackets. And so this is obviously finitely generated. It's also closed on Lee, under Lee brackets because each time I take Lee bracket of two things, the powers of T add up. And so they land in the correct module. So this is a singular foliation. Now, singular foliations has been studied by Anulatakis and Scandalis, and they introduced what they call bisubmersions, which are essentially local charts for what they call the holonomy group weight of singular foliations. And so our first observation is that bisubmersions for this specific singular foliation is exactly the same thing as the lifting method of Rothschild and Stein. These so things. Here you have to use some work by Deborah and Scandalis and uh, uh, Junkin, Van Erben Junkin. But essentially, what Rothschild and Stein were doing is exactly the same thing as studying by submersions for this specific singular foliation. Now, he, till now, we didn't win anything new. We just rewrote all things in new language. That's not uh, new by itself. But the point is that. And the relativities and scandalous defines the C star algebra of singular foliations. 
And so the sister algebra of, a, of that singular foliation is fibered over R plus. The fiber at non-zero time is a compact operators. And at time zero, it's the sister algebra of the group. And of course, you can compare this to constangent group read, which is also has this property. It's fibered over the compact operators. And at zero, it's sister algebra of the group, which because of commutativity, it's C0 of C star M. Okay. Now we the key point to proving this theorem is studying the space of representation or reducible unitary representation of this sister algebra. So as I said, it's very simple. It's just Compact operators only have one irreducible unitary representation. So the space of representation is just one line, uh, R plus star. And at zero, you have all of the groups with all of the representations. Now, the key point is that this is a topological space. And this is where our method differs from Rothschild and Stein. Rothschild and Stein, their method, you get maximal hypolipticity from the lift, and then you push it forward to the manifold. But ultimately, what you care about is the manifold itself. You don't care about what happens on the lift. You only, the only thing you care about is what happens on the manifold. So the only thing you care about is this representation, all of the representations on this line. And because it's a topological space and the felt topology, you are forced to look at anything in the closure, but only the closure. You don't care about anything which is outside the closure. And so call the closure, whatever it is, T star analytic. So, so the limits at all of the representations which can appear. And then our work is two theorems, which are proved independently of each other using different methods. So the first one is that our regularity theorem holds if you replace this set with the analytic set. This theorem is just, you, up, you use the methods from uh, uh, Rothschild and Stein. You just Im improve them. Uh, but that's ultimately what they were doing. But instead of using maximum regularity on the lift, you, you, you use these representations. You, you, you write the short exact sequence for pseudo differential calculus in this work, and then you get it immediately from this. And the second theorem is that this set is actually the one conjectured by Helfer and Nori, the, the one defined by Helfer and Nori again 79, the ones that I gave you. This theorem is proved without any mention of pseudo differential operator. It has very little to do with pseudo differential operators. It's proved using a blow up of singular affiliations. So, so what, the main issue with singular affiliation is that the leaves don't have the same dimension. Uh, in a previous work, I gave a method to blow up singular affiliations so that all of the leaves have the same dimension, or at least the dimension function becomes a continuous function. Here, the issue is that the groups don't have the same dimension. That's the groups are the leaves. So you blow up this. And once you blow up the singular affiliation, you get this equality. This is a this is very simple C star algebra statement. What happens is that there's so this C star algebra is not a continuous field. This is the whole problem. Conis tangent group with is a continuous field. This one is not a continuous field. There's only one quotient of this C star algebra, which can be a continuous field and which keeps all of these representations. From one side, we know that it is the quotient which corresponds to this set. But from the other side, I can reconstruct this quotient as the sister algebra of the blow up. I, but, the, but the blow up was defined using a locally compact other of Gupoid. And the topology of that blow up was precisely the topology that Alpha and Noriga used in their 79 article. And so you get immediately that these two sets have to be the same set. And that's okay thanks a lot omar for this great talk so are there questions Harry? Uh, i i assume that this uh, contains the calculus pseudo i, I mean this kind of index theory on Heisenberg uh, manifold. Yes. It, I, I didn't it, it that generalizes that, that right? Yes, no? yes, yes. The, 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 there was a some, so, so there was two articles by Banner in uh, in the analysis. Okay. No, yeah, you mentioned that, but, but but there is a whole theory of Heisenberg manifolds. 
you yes know, you know yeah, that. that that also generalizes for heisenberg manifolds right it, it, it i mean you 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 take any vector Horman, vector fields which satisfy hormandel's condition with yes. weights so well, that's included in the definition of the heisenberg manifold so you, you can do anything you want to mm -hmm. Yes, I have one one question, which, um, but I I really don't know. It, when you were talking about your uh, blow up construction, yes. was I was wondering, yes, I I was just wondering about the link with uh, the notion of flatness in algebraic geometry. You know, flat morphism, if there is any, because. Um, so what 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 is flatness? For, is is because. Uh, this is torsion issue or what, what what is the issue which flatness tries to solve you mentioned some limits towards uh, on the point of the singular uh, of the special so, so so let me mention the connection with algebraic geometry that i know is that uh, so in the yeah. fifth uh, I, I don't know uh, this answers your question but that's the connection i know with con algebraic geometry so in the 50s there is Hironaka's blow up of uh, algebraic varieties yeah and in his article he defines a blow up which he attributes to john nash uh -huh. and, and, and the idea in that blow up is extremely similar to the blow up that i give here i see i see i see but so what, what i am suggesting is that it would be good to connect it with the notion of flat morphism in um, algebraic geometry it's worth looking at it a bit okay i, I will look into it uh, I, I, my algebraic geometry. I, 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 I'm sure I saw the definition of flat before, but I don't remember. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, I see that uh, Jean-Michel Bismuth is around. Uh, okay. But he, he doesn't have his microphone. So, yes, uh, Masoud, you have some question or? Um, not really. No, very really. interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, no, it was a, it was a perfectly comprehensible yeah. and a very nice talk. Yes, I am yeah, very great. positive. Yes. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, we we thank you, Omar, for this great talk. Okay. Thanks, Omar. Yeah. Okay.